Hello and welcome to the next edition of the Scout Trio podcast. Today we have myself, Zach, and Blake with us. Uh, What we're basically going to do today is we're going to walk you through our pref list in preparation for the draft. The draft starts on Monday, um, and this is Friday before the draft. So, like I said, we're just going to walk you through our pref list, having a cup of cocktails outside, and just enjoying beautiful Friday. And, uh, yeah, let's kick it off. Uh, Blake will end up doing most of the questioning today. I'll ask Blake a few questions about players that he likes, things of that nature, uh, as we progress through. But, um, Blake, let's kick it off and start off with the first question. So Nick Madrigal is number one on our prep list here. Um, What makes Nick number one? So with Madrigal, he's, he's an explosive athlete for me personally. The only detriment for Madrigal is his height. He's about my height. He's about 5'6", five, 5'7", five, maybe 5'8". But what stands out about him is A, his baseball acumen, B, his hit tool, and C, just his overall feel for the game, uh, whether it be hands at the plate, defensive instincts, just overall game acumen that plays along with the baseball instincts touched upon earlier. He has... An ability to barrel up the baseball that I haven't seen from any other amateur prospect that I've ever scouted. Uh, I've only been doing this about five years, but at the same time, the way the hands work at the play, the way the hands work in all four quadrants of the strike zone, his ability to pull 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 a fastball, sit on a breaking ball, sit on a fastball, pull a breaking ball, just all those different attributes that he's able to have, it allows me to project a potential even 70 hit tool, a, a future grade on a hit tool that I've never done before on an amateur player. And even with the overall offensive profile for Madrigal, he would probably be the second highest offensive prospect I've ever graded out. Uh, as a college player, behind Keston Hira, who the Brewers took with their ninth, uh, the ninth pick overall last year, uh, and the third player on that list would be Malcolm Fordo, who's playing big, uh, big league center field for the Mets right now. But what separates Madrigal as a better overall prospect than Hira or a Conforto is his ability to stay on the dirt. So, for me, I have no doubt in my mind that. Madrigal will be at least a sixth defender at second base, and I think there's an outside chance he's a shortstop. I think the arm can play average, so it's, it's, it's not the best case situation for him to play short, but at the same time, he's a 60 defender at second because he's got seven hands that translate well over defensively. He's got that average arm. He has good, very extremely good instincts to be in the right place at the right time, always understand what he needs to do to get the job done. While the footwork needs to be cleaned up a little bit, he's just that guy that I can trust to play up the middle at the next level at a very high level. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. So let's talk about two high school guys. Um, one, Cole Wynn from Orange Lutheran High School, right-handed pitcher, and Bryce Terang, shortstop, Santiago High School. You have them rated as the same grade, B6-7. Um, going in the first round, Cole Wynn, rumor has it, he can go as high as two. Um, Bryce Terang, first round also on our prep list. Um, why is Cole Wynn with the same grade? You have him down as 4.2 mil, and Bryce Terang is 3.7. Great question. So start. let's start with Wynn. He's a little bit rated, a little bit higher. Wynn actually started out, uh, Blake and I actually saw his first start of the season uh, against Marina back in early February, and he was, he was up to 96, showed a breaking ball, athletic kid who was able to repeat a little bit. But at the same time, we weren't sure that he was that legit first-round grade the night we saw him, the very first time. Uh, he struggled with his arm swing a little bit. His timing and his delivery was a little bit off. He, it, it just wasn't as consistent. The breaking ball flashed some really good stuff, but at the same time, it just wasn't there consistently. But at the same time, as I saw a win, I saw five starts of wins uh, throughout the spring. He's consistently gotten better and better and better and better. And my la- last time seeing him, he's he's 92-96 with, with 
above average life on the fastball, able to get swings and misses with it. Both breaking balls have flashed at least six, if not better for me. You got a change up that's it's a, way behind the other two pitches. Uh, but my fourth time out, he actually threw one six change up that you're like, wow, that can be a separating pitch for him. And he's also got the two other breaking balls. Sign me up for that kid. I mean, he's an athletic kid who can be able to repeat his delivery and just throws enough strikes for me where I think at least that kid's a three-star in the big leagues. And I don't put that lightly. There's very few guys on this prep list I think could have a chance to be a three-star in the big leagues, but Cole Wynn's definitely one of them. So with that, let's move down to Terang. Terang, the first time I saw him was... The summer going into his, uh, I believe it was a sophomore year of high school, uh, he was playing with the USA 15 and under team, and it was at, I remember it was at Cal State Fullerton, um, and he was just launching balls. And I'm like, who the heck is this 15-year-old just literally destroying baseballs, showing an all-field gap approach um, during batting practice? This kid had all the tools and I didn't and I didn't know who he was at that time, but then I started reading a little bit more online about him and, and he was th- the next guy. Um, so I got a chance to see Terang before his junior year of high school at area codes. He looked like that explosive athlete with extremely good tools at the plate. Um, defensively, he's gonna stick it shortstop for me and he's an elite at least a six defender there, if not a seven. He's got this Super quick hands with super quick transfer. The footwork is a six. The arms at six. Maybe you have a seven. He's gotten all the tools to stick up the middle. But what has worried me and why he doesn't place over win and why he doesn't place over Madrigal is the offensive profile hasn't taken that leap forward that I thought it might when I saw him three years back. So when I saw him three years back, I'm like, this guy is probably going to be go 1-1. And if he doesn't go 1-1, he's going top five picks. Right now, I'm not sold he's that good because I'm not sold on the bat and how it's progressed. But at the same time, he's a first rounder for sure because he's going to stick a shortstop. He's, he's a plus runner. He's an athletic kid with very good instincts. His dad played in the big leagues. He's... For my money, he should go in the top 15 picks, and that's where we basically have him slotted at. Like As Blake mentioned, we had him about $3.75 million. That would be about the 14th, 15th pick in the draft. So I feel confident confident that both of those players win in Terang with the number two and number three picks on our pref list. Our both first-rounders uh, both have very good chances to be all-star players in the big league someday, and both have the ceiling to be even better than that. They have is the ceiling to be perennial All-Stars. If Terang is able to improve his offensive profile and wins able to be more consi- as consistent as he's been this spring as he progresses into his early and late 20s, those guys have a ch- very good chance to be perennial All-Stars. So Madrigal, Win, Terang, those three kids are going to be pretty darn good at the next level. Uh, this is great stuff right there. Um, let's stay in the high school ranks, and let's talk about a kid from Beckman High School, another shortstop, Matt McLean. We have him listed here as a C56 with a million dollars signing in the second round. Um, what are your thoughts on him? So with McLean, um, another guy that people thought that were gonna be a, it, it was going to be a decent prospect. I didn't have a chance to see McLean. Um, because I was up in Helena last summer, so I didn't get to see him play with area codes or anything like that. Um, but when I saw him the first time this spring, I was like, wow, that dude's got a chance to play. He's a little bit taller than Madrigal, uh, probably 5'9", 5, 5'10", 5, uh, but the biggest detriment to him, again, is his uh, size. I think he has a chance to hit for more power than Madrigal, but at the same time, I don't think the hit tool is quite as advanced. Where Madrigal, like as I mentioned earlier, is a potential 4 7 hitter, uh, 4 present, 7 future. Uh, McLean for me is more of a, uh, is a 2. Uh, I don't really rate any high school hitter who's a 3. Um, but at the same time, 
McLean's m- more advanced than most high school hitters. I've seen him be able to barrel balls in all four quadrants. Uh, but he does get on his front side a little bit early. But the hands really do work. He's able to manipulate the barrel head a little bit. Um, it's, an adva- it's an advanced high school hit tool. Uh, where has a chance to be an, a strong average hit tool in the future. Uh, for me, McLean's best attribute defensively is body control. It's it's at least 60. I want to put a 65 grade on his body control where it's a strong average arm. He's able to make the plays from all the forehand, backhand, in the hole, anything you want him to do defensively. He's going to be a strong average defender at shortstop for me. So where the biggest question mark is moving down the line is – how is it all going to come together? So if we're talking about a 55 defender at short with a 55 hit tool and potential 40, 45 power, that's where we get to the six. But at the same time, we're talking about a high school player here who's a far away down the line from, away from that. So conservatively, he's not, at least going to be an average big leader because he's going to be able to produce at a premium position and hit something offensively. So even if a team has a plus shortstop where they don't think that McLean can profile the best there, he's going to be able to profile at second base, where he's still going to be at least an above average, if not plus defender at second, where he's going to hit enough to be an average regular. So with a guy like that, that guy's not getting out of the top two rounds. So that's where the million-dollar evaluation comes into play. That kid's a seven-figure player, and if you wanted to argue that he's a $1.5 million player, I probably wouldn't argue with you. If you wanted to say he's a four million dollar player, I'm not quite there yet because they're just there. While I do think there's a chance to bat to play 55 in the future, there is some inconsistencies, and he's only 18 years old, and you have the size and everything like that that plays into play f- further down the line. Where I halt the brakes, I'm very comfortable with him at one million dollars. Like I said, I'd be, I'd be fine if I was convinced to give him 1.5. But if you get him into the higher first round range, I can't really get there. But if we're starting to talk about the comp A round and as we work our way down in the second round, he's the type of player I would definitely consider taking there. So now let's put uh, Bryce Terang back in the mix here. Um, I know Matt McLean is another high school shortstop as we were talking about them being both shortstops. Some people do have Matt McLean over Bryce Terang, but I know you, Zach, can't go that high. Um, what makes you not put Matt McLean over Terang? That's a great question, Blake. And it all, it all for me, maybe I'm harboring too much in the past, but all for me goes back to when I saw Terang for the first time. I saw him as a 15-year-old kid, and just the tools, the play I saw at that time were so far advanced that I'm like, there's so much in there with that particular player that he's going to be a, he, he's going to be a great major leaguer someday. And while, as I touched, t- touched on earlier, those offensive tool set hasn't imp- hasn't improved the way I thought it would, it's still enough where I think that there is a I have a current about three million dollar, a little less than three million dollar difference between the two players. And furthermore, defensively, Terang 100% is a shortstop. I don't think that you would talk to many people who don't think that Terang's a shortstop. The people that you talk to Terang who have McLean over him talk about the offensive profile and you think that the McLean is going to have a better offensive profile than Terang. And while I don't personally agree, I don't see, I don't disagree to the fullest extent. I, I don't say no, 100% not. I can see where you're getting at. But for me, just the way the hips fire, the hands, there's so many extra movements with Terang's hands that I believe that once a player development system gets Terang under their wing, they're going to be able to smooth a lot of those things out to where Terang is going to end up being the superior player. And I'm not saying that McLean's going to be a bad player at all. We have a C5-6 on him. We think he's going to be an average big leaguer with a chance to be an all-star. But with Terang, I just, for me, and like I said earlier, it may be me harboring a little bit much of what I saw in the past from him. I just think that kid's going to be a perennial. It has a chance to be a perennial all-star. 
He's going to stick up the mid. He's going to stick at shortstop, not just up the middle. He's going to stick up at shortstop, and he's going to have enough offensive profile to move us down the line where you say that kid's one of the better players in the big leagues. Not just one of the better players at shortstop, one of the better players in the big leagues, where McLean's probably going to be one of the better players up the middle in the future. Both quality, quality players that I would love to have in my organization someday. Um, but for me, Terang is the superior prospect. All right, now so now let's move on to uh, another high school right-handed pitcher from Santa Margarita. We love the SoCal kids. Um, Chandler Champlain, we have him as a great uh, going in the third round, C4560, with a signing bonus of or signing of $800,000. Um, why do you put that there? We do love SoCal kids. It's, it's beautiful out here. Um, last thing you can do out here is can complain about the weather. But with Champlain, uh, first time I saw Champlain out was in early February. Uh, it was a, it was a start on a Saturday before the really season started. I think they were like still wearing their fall ball uniforms. Every uh, the umpire didn't show up. I remember that. Um, but there was quite a bit of heat early in to see Champlain. Uh, he sat eighty nine ninety two if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, above average life on the fastball, but more importantly, he showed. Uh, advanced fastball both command and control during that outing could spot to all four quadrants uh and had a really good working working breaking ball that flashed six sat 50 55 but at the same time a two pitch right-handed pitcher in high school with that advanced command control both his breaking ball and his fastball that's advanced so that's where i put champlain after my first viewing as a 1.1 million dollar valuation i had him as a b56 i thought he needed to lose a little bit of weight i thought um the body just didn't look great but at the same time the arm really worked he's really able to spin a breaking ball so he was a seven uh, seven figure dollar uh seven figure player for me after that viewing uh when i saw him after the second time some things improved, some things weren't as good. Um, so there was a slight decrease in the value for me after that second viewing. That second viewing, the velo was a ton better. He sat 92-94, touched 96. And, but at the same time, the fastball straightened out. He had below average fastball command control. And the breaking ball was a 40 that day. So when 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 you get to that... You weigh all those things out, but at the same time, the body looked a lot better. The arm worked better. Everything overall worked better, but just the stuff wasn't there. So he was the type of guy, if we had the opportunity to go see him a third time, he's a guy I would love to go see a third time. But at the same time, for me personally, I feel more, much more comfortable with him in the early third round than I do in the second round now because when I saw that advanced fastball command control, I was extremely impressed, and I saw the breaking ball, and I saw all the other attributes that he had. But when I saw the second outing, I was like, fastball velo is better, but this is the type of kid that shouldn't be thrown to the radar gun. He's the guy you can dot on all four quadrants with present velocity that can rear back for a little bit extra when he needed to, and then always have that breaking ball and some raw feel for a changeup that will progress as he goes through player development in the future that there's no way I can give that kid less than an $800,000 valuation because there's just too many raw tools still here. So while the second start wasn't as good as the first start and caused me to move him a little bit farther down the list, he's still a top 100 pick for sure. As long as the dollar valuation, the bonus demands and everything all line up and he ha- he's not dead set on going to school, he's... a top 100 pick for me personally because there's too many raw tools there that um, I would love to have. All right, so now let's move into the college ranks. Ole Miss, a very popular school for me and Zach here. Um, We love the South. We love SEC baseball. (laughs) Um, We have a lot of guys, a handful of guys from Ole Miss on our prep list. Um, What guy, in your opinion, Zach, from Ole Miss is your number one guy? 
So a little bit of backstory here. Uh, Blake actually went to Ole Miss his freshman year, so that's why he added all those extra features about Ole Miss. I do love the South. Uh, I do, but Blake probably loves it a little bit more than I do. Uh, he loves SEC baseball. He loves Ole Miss. He loves SEC baseball in general. Um, but when when actually diving into baseball prospects at that school, uh, Ryan Rolison is clearly the best prospect for this year. Um, there are a few different players for the following years who have a chance to be very good players in the future. Um, but at the same time, for this particular uh, upcoming draft, um, Ryan Rollison, left-hand pitcher at Ole Miss, has a chance to be the best player. So when diving into Rollison, he's a left-handed arm, up to 93. I saw him in high school, pitched extremely well at that time, where he showed advanced ability, A, spot the fastball, and B, B really spinning the breaking ball. So then once again in this last outing when I saw him while pitching for Ole Miss, it was a potential seven breaking ball. The biggest question for me where I have a first-round grade on him versus having a top 10 or top 15 grade on him, that seven breaking ball wasn't as consistent. So there was a lot of four offerings. There was a lot of five offerings. So when we break down, if Rollison really has more of a 55 breaking ball versus a six or seven breaking ball, are we taking that guy in the top 10 or 15 picks? I personally can't get there because it's an, it's an average fastball from the left-hand side with a 55 breaking ball, that's a nice start in the big leagues, but that's likely a four, right, Blake? Yeah, I agree. You, you think that's likely a four? Mm-hmm. So are you taking a four in the first 10 or 15 picks? Not if you think that's a realistic ceiling or goal. Right. So, two, I think that a four starter to get in the top 40 picks is fantastic value. I, yeah, I do. Do you agree? Yep. So when we move farther down... With the command control struggling a little bit in that one outing, there's so many, once again, we we say raw tools a lot because they are raw. These are 18, 17, 22-year-old kids. Uh, There's a lot of room for improvement when it moves into player development and a lot of things moving down the line where guys can improve, guys can get better. So we're not so much worried about what we have now. We're worried about the raw ingredients to be able to mold them with player development-wise. So with Rollison, there's too many raw ingredients to keep him out of the first 40 picks for me. There's too many things that he has that most guys don't have. He has the he has the above-average arm speed. He has the above-average hand speed. He's left-handed with the feel for spin, with the feel for throwing the fastball well within the strike zone. For me, that's the top 40 pick. So that's where I like him enough, and he's a top player for sure for the senior – juniors – well, actually, Rollison's an uh, eligible sophomore. So eligible sophomores through senior class at Ole Miss. And let's note that Ole Miss hosting a regional, uh, we wish them all the luck, and we hope they go all the way to the College World Series. With that said, let's stay in the SEC and talk about University of Arkansas right-hand pitcher Blaine Knight first round in our opinion three million sign a six seven grade um what puts them there so uh i I don't like to pick sides i'm not the type of guy who says hey but just because a guy goes to school we're gonna root for them uh blake has a little more biases than i do uh so i like i said a great role to now on his pure talent not because he went to ole miss and uh blake thinks it's great um but with Knight in particular, he's the top college pitcher in my opinion for this draft. When we talk about rolls and we talk about his breaking ball, that's a special special quality that he has. Not a lot of guys have potential seven breaking balls. Rolson does. With Knight, what he possesses that's unique and rare is his ability to uh, command all four pitches. So he has a fastball that's a strong ad- average offering. He has a changeup that could potentially be a plus offering. He has a slider that could potentially be a plus offering. And he has a working breaking ball that can sequence well in. But at the same time, what he does extremely much better than any other college pitcher I've seen this year with the stuff that Knight possesses is his ability to sequence that all together and pitch. There's no doubt in my mind, similar to Rolison, where at least Knight's going to be a four-starter. 
in the big leagues. So when we're getting a first round grade, and I think this dude's no doubt going to be a first round uh, for a number four starter, I feel very comfortable with having him that high on the prep list where we're in a six seven. The biggest detriment to Knight, and similar to what we talked about about McLean and Madrigal earlier, is his size. So Knight doesn't have the same problem as McLean or uh, McLean or Madrigal. He's not short. He's about six two, six three, but he's skinny. So the biggest question for him is: Is he going to be able to log 180 or 200 innings, which is necessary for being a, th- a number three or potentially number two starter in the big leagues? For me. I worry a little bit more about that a little bit later and wor- let player development worry about that because what you're getting, once again, with the raw ingredients is special. His ability to spot the fastball, having present above average control of the fastball, having above average present con- uh, command of the fastball, his ability to sequence in the breaking ball, his ability to sequence in the changeup, that's a first rounder for me. That's where we get to $3 million valuation. That's where we get to almost a sentence of special, where I'm not sure if he'll ever be a one uh, because he doesn't throw 98 and he doesn't have a seven breaking ball. But I think there's an outside chance to play Knights of two. Um, and I, I don't put that lightly when I have an A6-7 on him. And just his special ability for me to put a six and a seven together on a player, it takes something special. Madrigal has a special hand, has a special hit tool. Terang has a special ability to stay up the middle, play shortstop. Wynn has all the special qualities you want in the world. He has the big arm. He has the ability for spin. He has the ability to command and strike some. And then when, once we're getting down to Knight, our fourth player on our prep list, he has that special quality to be able to pitch, but also has the stuff to do it with. So that's where Blaine Knight is clearly the top college pitcher on my prep list. So now let's talk about um, hitting. We've talked a lot about pitching, a little bit of hitting. Let's talk more now. So who on the preference prep list, Zach, is your number one college bat? So we already talked about Madrigal a little bit. So Madrigal would be the number one college bat. Um, so let's not spend too much more time talking about him. Um, but actually, the second college bat on our prep list would be his teammate. Uh, Trevor Larnich. So I first saw Larnich um, his freshman year at Oregon State during fall ball, uh, and I was really impressed by the size, his ability to whip the bat through the, uh, through the zone. Um, but during his first two years there, I was kind of un- uh, under-impressed by his ability to hit for power with that size and the way the swing worked. I still thought that there was enough hitability there that he could potentially be a top five round pick but where he's really taken off here this past year is buying into the launch angle a big trend in major league baseball and tapping more into his raw power so this year what i haven't seen from him in the past is his ability to buy in his raw power where during batting practice he'll show you 65 raw 65 raw is a term I don't put it on lightly. Guys, other guys on the prep list that have 65 raw are probably Luke and Baker and the um, Albie West uh, Weiss kid uh, from Cal State Northridge, um, and maybe Nick Ames from UNLV. But outside of that, there's not a lot of 65 raw. But where Larnish stands above um, both Baker and then moving farther down the list is uh, Ames and Weiss is the potential ability to hit as well. So, Larnage for me has a chance to be an average hitter. I'm not quite sure if he's going to get there, um, but I have liked his hit ability a little bit more in the past than they have this past year. This past year, I just saw a little bit more swing and miss than I would like. Uh, I know some guys have him going as high as nine. I personally can't get there. I think I, we have a two, $2.25 million valuation on Larnage. Is that correct, Blake? That is correct. 2.25? So that's where I feel most comfortable taking that player. Uh, he's not the quickest of foot, but he can get the job done in, uh, in right field. He has an above average. He has above average arm strength. So I don't see any problem with him playing right field in the future. We're just more. I'm more worried about the hit tool. I don't see any question about him being able to get to the power. Uh, I'm just more worried about the hit tool. And he's going to play a corner position where you're going to be need to be able to hit a little bit. But he does have good plate vision. He has good plate discipline. So he's going to be on, able to get on base enough. 
Um, so I'm not too worried about from that standpoint, from that aspect. But at the same time, he's – we don't really have a, another college player close to him. I believe the next college player – next college hitter, I apologize, is Baker. Is that correct? Yeah. So the next college player is Baker on that list. And and Baker's one point four five. So there there is clear separation between Magical at the very top, Larnish next, and then Baker as well. Where all three I think are very very good chance to be big leaguers someday. Um, so those would be top three um, college bats.